Hello and welcome to Preprints in Motion. Join us as we sit down with early career researchers and discuss their latest preprint and find out about their journey through the muddy marshes of academia. But we don't stop there. Every month we'll be bringing you special episodes with open science leaders where we discuss how to fix academia. Easy, right? So hit that subscribe button, leave a rating, or find us on Twitter at MotionPod. But for now, let's get into the show. This week we're joined by Stefano Vianello to talk about prefigurative preprints. Thank you for joining us. You were requested uh, by a couple of people, actually, based on the back of that really interesting article you wrote, which we'll get to. But I thought we'd start with your recent preprint that that article is kind of about. So you're a, a developmental biologist in terms of your background. So could you tell us a little bit about sort of what you've worked on in the past, what you what your lab work is? So I've always worked in developmental biology. Um, I work with stem with embryonic stem cells, mouse in my case, and we use them to make these in vitro models of embryo development that are called gastroloids, which essentially are you take the cells and then you let them aggregate in a, in medium, and they form a ball that then breaks symmetry by itself and then elongates. And when people have studied this, they've seen that it recapitulates many features of how the embryo develops, even though in vitro in the lab, they, they're not getting any of the cues from the mother that the embryo would get. And so you can make a lot of them because you make them in 96 square plates. And, and yeah, that's what, <laughs> that's what I work on. And specifically, I, I mean, in my PhD project, I've been studying them for the endoderm. So for the tissue that will make the gut tube and other organs and how we can use them to study endoderm and generate endoderm in vitro from an embryonic perspective. That's cool. They, they, um, I've seen microscopy images of those and they always look really cool. Yeah, I, I like doing immunostaining on them <laughs> and, and getting nice pictures. Yeah, they, they are always really cool. So what we're going to talk to you today, though, is, is not really any of that sciencey stuff. We're going to be talking about more, I guess, academic culture and the publishing side of things. Mm -hmm. So how did you get interested in that, seeing as how you're a developmental biologist? I mean, I've always been interested in the topic of open openness, open source, open access even from my a family point of view. Um, but, uh, and then the lab, I was um, doing my master's and my undergraduate research in, which was the in Cambridge, the lab of Alfonso Martinez Arias. He was, so my PI then was very in favor and encouraging and promoting open science practices. So when I started my PhD in 2000, 14, 15. Um, it was also more or less the time when in in biology, at least in developmental biology, uh, bioarchive was starting to be used or accepted. And so I yeah, entered academia in this context and in the context of a lab that was approving of it and promoting it. And then uh, in my PhD, I, I mean, I kept going for it and um and also it's, it's from um it's from your interaction right with the people around you and your experiences with the uh, people that don't support uh open science right that sometimes push you to go even stronger in in exploring or in um uh in refining your position in all of this if you're forced to advocate for your own points of view, you 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 kind of start um, looking for information, looking for context, looking for why you're in it, and then it just evolves from there. I mean, so BioArchive started up in 2013, so this, it must be quite cool to be in one of those labs that was an early adopter of the whole thing, because a lot of people sitting in the biosciences, it was really sort of 2017 onwards where you saw more of an uptake more generally across bioscience, um, outside of bioinformatics and neuroscience, for some reason, uh, they were both they were both the early adopter fields. But I, I don't know what neuroscientists are on about, but they like they like preprints apparently. 
Yeah, and you also need, I mean, yeah, you also need to personally then want to ad adopt these things. Um, but it's true that if any PI is listening, <laughs> uh, they really have a strong role in um, favoring this or um, helping students going towards uh, this path or not in the opposite case. Yeah, we've, I think we've kind of been maybe a bit biased in who we select for this, but a lot, a lot of the people who've come on have, have always seemed to have had quite supportive PIs and all. I think that helps a lot because obviously if your PI doesn't want to preprint, ultimately there's not a lot you can do, as much as you might like to argue with them. Yeah, uh, well, there is, there is supporting and then not supporting. And I think the really unlucky um, situation is when you have a PI that is actively disapproving of preprints in this case. And then you have to fight or other strategies of survival. <laughs> Just give up and go along with it. It's the easy route. Uh, so, so you posted this preprint and you did this with the intention of sort of that being the, the end goal. And I'm just going to read out a bit from this article you've written because I think it kind of sums things up quite nicely. So the framing of the preprint as in the pre of a print, as if it was waiting for something else, as if it was incomplete, crystallizes a scenario where the preprint exists and it's longing for something more. Which is really nice. Well, well written, that bit right in there. So, but this kind of summarizes quite nicely the whole point of what we're going to be talking about today, which is the idea that a bit like it works in physics, where the preprint is the final goal and then maybe publishing is for curation or just a formality, which is how physicists do. So what led you to take that decision? So there is some some um, degree of, I wouldn't say disappointment, but disagreement or non-alignment with with the direction of some of this, in, or with the, with the goals that initiatives or platform or whatever the preprint servers or preprinting seems to be designed for or against. I come from a, a standing point where I don't want the alternative publishing um, practice or initiative to be a parallel thing to um, journals still existing or journals still uh, getting something out of it. So uh, like publishing on a preprint platform to then still sending to a journal or reviewing for a preprint uh, curation initiative to then um, sending this review or, or getting uh, hired by a journal. You know, I, I would prefer initiative that are clearly designed to disrupt the problematic situation. There, of course, there is the point that they won't get uh, approved by the majority of people. And so, but I would like less uh, being in between. Yeah. And this is, th this is this idea of prefigurative politics, right? So this idea that you behave in the way, you, uh, in the change that you want to see, right? Yeah. Um, the concept of prefigurative was also to reclaim the word preprint itself, to make it lose this aspect of still validating the, the normalization of there being a print. In my case, I really don't, I don't want my work to be in a journal even though there's different degree of journals. And so I'm, I'm not putting in there, as I, as I wrote, like I'm not putting in there because the statistics show that you, you will get more citation or because, yeah, because I, I can't wait. I don't want to wait two years uh, of review and then have it there. I just don't want any of these things. So, and, and you can just post it there. If you're fine with not being in a journal, and also by putting it like that, actually it enhances or it gives you more, it transforms the preprint that you're going to put. Because if you're putting it there for an end goal journal, you're going to put it there with all the constraint of the journal you want to um, get it in. So the layout. So it also reduces um, some of the advantages that the preprint platform would have allowed you to get. Yeah, formatting has not been a fun couple of weeks for me. It feels like all I do every time. So we we submitted our last paper was submitted to BioArchive with the intention of that being its final resting place. We, we weren't intending to submit that to a journal because I was senior author and as a postdoc, you don't have money to, to pay the publishing fees. And I don't want to publish work that isn't isn't open access. As it happens, we did end up submitting to a journal because another group 
came along who wanted to collaborate with us and they're going to pay our fees for us it's very nice um so so we've, we've been stuck in that reformatting round for a little bit now because i keep keep not doing the right formatting every time they send it back to me um but hopefully hopefully the last one went off today one of the other things that is really good about your print in particular, because we can use this as a really good example, is that yours was also peer reviewed and that peer review is alongside on BioArchive. So one of the benefits, of course, of preprint service is that you can update your work as you go. So if you get some peer review or some feedback, you can you can update, it, which I think you guys did. Yeah. So yeah, even there, so you're never sure whether people like that. So I mean, I've read some people that are big in preprints don't see it as a place where to put living documents or this, yeah. this kind of changing version. We did. So I pub in reality I published it, I think, one year ago and then no well, maybe more. I mean, immediately after we just put a small correction of, of like citation, this kind of thing. And then um, one year later, I think it was exactly one year later, um, we added a whole, I mean, a whole second part of it because people know that, um, okay, that, that preprint was about endoderm and gastroloid. So now there's going to be more about it on the same topic and the versions are there and you can see them then my pi put it on on twitter the announcement that it had been updated with with more and uh yeah i see i see preprint as a as a living thing that you just update until um until whenever you want, you know, you, you add things, you change things, yeah, you make it stronger and stronger with more and more information on on that topic. So I, I, I like that idea. That, that's sort of how I tend to use preprints. The fact that you can change stuff is great, even if it is simply simple like a typo, because the moment you submit to a journal, that's when you find all your typos. Not before, never, ever, ever before. I swear somebody inserts the typos when you press submit. There's a little thing that goes through and just puts them in randomly. Yeah, also for preprints. <laughs> uh, anytime, you, anytime there's a submit button, that submit button comes with the cost of a few typos. That's the price you pay for pressing the button. <laughs> I forgot what I was going to say now. I got distracted by typos. So, so, so you can you can update and stuff. But I guess a flip side to that is that you know. So you mentioned that you were, you added this quite big section, and you the PI announces this on Twitter. That's great. But what if you're someone who maybe is from a small lab, who maybe your name's not very well known, maybe not got a big Twitter following? What would you suggest for that situation? Because then, if you update your preprint, chances are, even if you announce it, nobody's really going to notice. And that the that's the difference between say posting a subsequent preprint or a paper. Yeah, so I dislike that part. I mean, I was like you, I mean, both of you in, in pre light So in like in highlighting curation and you no, know, in situation where you're, you're picking which preprints are worth to be highlighted and, and there's a, a, a lot of problems with that too. Um, so I, I don't like that aspect that, I mean, it's people that already know and love that get their research known and known even more. So I don't have a recommendation for the person in the lab that is not known to make, make their research known, but the recommendation is for that the readers, that people that are looking, I mean, all of us, that want to see information that is not by these same labs, to search intentionally and to search preprint servers in intentionally away from the first thing that comes out or the lab that anyway they're going to see and there's a lot of value in that in my case i'm in a lab that i think we could not say i mean we cannot say anything it would be it will be searched and it would be seen but i i think from a small lab publishing a new preprint or an update of a previous preprint will have similar effect. I think when you update the preprint, it still goes to the top page. Yeah, they do, they do, on, the... they do on BioArchive and MedArchive at least, yeah. But yeah, I think the change should be, I mean, the burden of, of this should be on the on the readers if they want to feel the need to but then. Because if, if the readers don't feel the need of uh, wanting more complete information and are happy just reading the same labs, then also there's no point in trying to convert them yeah yeah I mean, I, there are i think there are certain particularly big names who are, are not gonna come around to any of the ideas here at all because it's not it's not how they work it's not what they it's not what they understand shall we say nicely yeah but i have to say i've always been in big names lab so i i speak from that hmm. that not never having had that problem but 
uh, also from someone that doesn't want to read the research from <laughs> big name labs. So, I mean, I, people would probably describe you slightly more radical than I am, and I think I seem to push for quite a lot of change. But you, you would push for a complete rethinking of the whole publishing structure, whereas I still can kind of see places for journals, I guess, maybe. So, so you've, you've outlined sort of four key points that you think sort of need to be changed in your article. So I, I figured it would be good if we just took those one by one. So your first point is that we should refuse both closed access publishing and the article processing charge based open access models. I hate the APC charge. All they've done is shift the charge to us instead of where it was originally. What, would you like to expand on that a little bit? I mean, I agree completely on that point. I even have t-shirts that say refuse APC. So <laughs> this is the <laughs> this is the thing I want to find for. It's more so some journals, I don't know if we can make journal names, but like we, eLife. Name name whoever you want. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> eLife at least is self aware and and uh, explicitly lists or describes the problems with their publishing model of APCs. That's still a problem because you, you, I mean, you're asking people to pay you money and not to make it open access, to not put the paywalls that the journal will put otherwise. So it's like, um, yeah, it's some sort of ransom in, in a sense. And the the thing that annoyed me, and I think it's um, PhD students should know, it's like when a journal tells you you can you can publish freely with us, and the freely means a paywall article, and then you tell them, oh, well, I don't want I, you're paywalling my article, and then they tell you, no, we, you can also put it open access, but that's not not the free version. That that's not a real choice that that, that you can make, and doesn't matter if you're going to use that money for whatever nice um, support initiative or funding scheme. It's more that you're still, you're putting a, an inequitable step towards uh, doing good with that money hmm. in some way, where you could have just from the beginning found alternative income or activities that, 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 that doesn't require authors publish this. So even though there's nuances and, and different versions that you can um, rate this APC uh, uses or justification, we need to refuse it from the beginning. Like, no, I'm not, I'm not going to pay you. Yeah. So I'm going to put it somewhere that allows me to do just that without either putting paywalls and doesn't charge me for not putting them. And I think we've got to remember where that the money for all this comes from, because for the most part, all this money is coming from charitable donations. And I'm pretty certain the average person walking down the street would not be overly happy to know that their charitable money has just gone to line some publisher's pocket. Yeah. And we've got, you know, I mean, these publishers are not just, we've covered this in previous episodes, but they've got profit margins. Some of them have profit margins bigger than Apple and Google and we're doing all the work. So they're not, they're not doing much for us. You know, they're, they're not, they're not doing anything for us because it's not like they do all the formatting for us. It's not like they'll do the press release for us or they'll promote the article for us. We do all of that. We write all those things. We do the peer review for them. And so it's a system where holding us to hostage is quite a, a, a good way of putting it, I think, actually. Only we're, we're also holding the gun for some reason. Yeah. And no, they they're very hands off, and so I think I think it would I think we're certainly with the pandemic we're we're probably getting to a point where at some point we'll see a big expose in a, a big newspaper or on some big TV channel about the publishing system in academia because I don't think people actually appreciate and understand how it works outside of science and in science we just accept it wrongly as that's how it is. Yeah, exactly. So it's the accepting, it's not just the information. No, I mean, it's more that the people in, in academia that know this, I mean, people that work in publishing know this because it's their job. So first of all, for any like PhD student that is listening to this, there are papers on publishing, on the consequences of APC, on uh, inequalities built in uh, different publishing models. So when, when you're going to uh, either oppose or, or support, you're not just saying a weird uh, conspiracy theory that you're just invented. You're just saying things that are studied and whether these studies uh, reach your area of 
academia or not, that's another problem. But you and if they don't, like, why is no one in this community talking about this? Why is everyone pretending APC uh, disapproval is some something weird? Then that's the problem on the community in which you're in. But there are research exactly on this. That's a good point. There is. I think often all scientists would benefit from stepping back and actually looking at how we do science more. And there's a lot of research on this. In the UK, there's now a research on research institute that looks specifically at all these kind of topics. I've done a little bit of this. And there's a lot, there, there are a lot of labs who look at research and how we do research and the process of not just publishing, but so there's a really good paper going around Twitter at the moment about p-value and how easy it is to manipulate and why we shouldn't be relying on the p-value but often you still see people relying on p-values because it's just it's how it's done right and people don't take the step back to think about all of this and so one of the other things you mentioned is this idea of this, this, this cost introduces this inequality in publishing because obviously if you're I mean if you're a postdoc you can't you've got no money to, po- to, to pay these costs if you're not from the west or one of the richer asian countries you haven't got the money necessarily to publish and pay these costs. If you're from Africa, you don't have the money to be wasting on these kind of costs. A lot of African researchers that I know do have the money to pay these, but that money would be much better spent in somewhere where they could hire a new lab tech with that money, or they could do a bit more research with that money. I think we're a little bit spot on the West in that, relatively speaking, we have a lot of money in research, and there is a lot of waste with that money, this being one of those wastes. But that kind of leads us on to the, the, the second point of your four key points, which is to decenter the Global North scientific outputs, conceptions of science, and evaluations of science. And this is, again, really important point because certainly at the moment, science is very much, it's not just Global North, it's Western centric. It's America and Europe basically control science output for the most part at the moment, which isn't how it's always been. So I'm reading a really, well, say I'm reading, I've been reading it for about three months now, but I'm reading a book about the history of science. And it used to be that, you know, science was based in, uh, Iraq, and that was the center of science. Science before that has been based in uh, Japan and China, and that was the center of science. And just so happens that currently it is in America, really, I guess. Although it looks like China and Japan are kind of pulling it back from America. Um, So how do we tackle that? I mean, preprints help a little bit because they make things a bit more equal. But again, if you've not got... It's how you get your word out about that science, I guess. Because if you're not... If that's not your first language, you know, all most of science at the moment is written in English. And if that's not your first language, I've seen people complaining about peer review reports where the reviewers are saying, we're not going to accept this just because the English is bad, which is nonsense. Because if the science is good, that, that should be all that matters. So how, how do we tackle that little yeah. big challenge? So this may be like leaks back to i mean discussion about being in a big lab in a small lab yeah again so for me it doesn't seem i mean so if you're a postdoc phd student and um in western academia and all the conferences about your topic have only speakers from usa europe japan australia so global north and never from the global south or peripheries or is you know even the peripheries within europe so czech republic um i don't know lithuania so there's like a fractal center periphery thing going on you know then you start really to believe that oh maybe developmental biology is only done in these con in these countries you, you need to first start to refuse that so i don't care if you tell me that developmental biology was born with aristotle I, I will just say no and i refuse to believe that no one was doing the developmental biology before that and also no one is is doing developmental biology now outside of these places and it's just that you're not inviting them, you're not looking for them, you're not reading them. And again, you're not uh, looking for preprint for them. And even, uh, that's another layer, that even when you want to read these things, like I want to read developmental biology preprint from the Philippines, for example, you cannot easily search for them on some platform because very simply you cannot search by author affiliation so by default you're always searching by the most common um, affiliation that there is which is us usa uk 
So it, you really need to go intentionally through a lot of hoops to find the information that, that is not appearing in front of you, which you can do, but it needs to be a decision. It needs to be a decision that only comes once you decided that you, you, you want to see that information. And so if by default a PhD student doesn't do anything, because it doesn't have time or just it doesn't realize uh no it doesn't realize that there's other research that is not being shown to them uh then it, it, they won't do it uh, again you, we have to reclaim our agency in all of this and refuse things that are presented as the norm and and say well i'm not going to go to this conference because i already know who's going to speak there like all the past years or i'm going to search for a conference organized in Southeast Asia. Maybe there is a society of developmental biology there that no one is telling me about. Yeah. And it's, I mean, in our case, a case of, uh, I mean, I'm Italian, so it's still you from a Western academia go, going uh, somewhere else as a person from Western academia. So then your intention may be um, questionable you're doing complete science by not considering. It's like if you were doing a review and you're, I mean, that's what happens. No, it's like you're doing a review and you're only citing research from one part of the world. So if you were, if I was just to cite Italian research, someone would tell me, what about all this UK stuff? But if I only cite UK, USA and European science, no one is coming because who is judging me is also someone telling me, look, you didn't cite any developmental biology from this other country. Because for many people, it doesn't, either it doesn't exist, or it's not relevant, or it's not serious, or is, uh, you know, just local, and it's not valid. Yeah. I mean, chances are they're going to be asking you to cite more of their work anyway, if they ask also. for it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, this isn't a, I mean, open science kind of helps a bit with some of this, but this is much a, a much bigger problem with science in general and society in general, really. It's things like where funding goes and how we distribute wealth across the world. It's things like representation is really important. That was a really good point, I thought, where you, know, you go to, I, I hate conferences, mainly because once you've been to one, you don't need to go to another one for five years at least, because all the speakers are the same and they don't talk about new stuff. They might have a slide in that's new that they did this year. But everything else is just, oh, this is what I did 20 years ago. Aren't I amazing? And they're not because they did it 20 years ago and I don't care anymore. And it's mostly presenting work that's already published. So I've already read it. So why are you telling me a bit? I, I'm, I, I've heard, I've read it, I've seen it, I'm bored now. So, I mean, I think some of the things we we, we could do as, as those people at the bottom of the totem pole and sometimes quite often reminded of that, I think we can do things like push for better representation in our seminar speakers, for example. Get more women speakers in because they're underrepresented. Get basically just get less white men who are middle class. Get 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 rid of those. We don't need any more of those, really. You know, get more people who are who are not not from the UK. Invite people who are outside of the UK if you're hosting a series in the UK. Get people who aren't big name professors. Get get you know postdocs and P, and PhD students and people who've just yeah, started. Yeah, if I that. can add to that, also um, realizing that you don't need to get them in your conference, like. They are organizing conferences on their own. And I mean, I PhD students or development scientists from another country. And you can just attend as a as an audience without yeah, without uh, yeah, feeling like you're 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 doing a favor to to other people. But yeah, exactly. So and it's not being against uh, the big names in the field is that these big names will be seen and their research known regardless. Now I want to know more and other things. And, 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 and at the same time, I will still hear about yours just by being in this, in this context. But you cannot do both. So, so as a preprint highlighter, I cannot highlight both. Like I'm going to highlight people from this famous lab and people from less, less famous lab. This is, again, this, this is this intermediate thing that I don't like. I just highlight what you want to promote and the, the other one will, will still be known. And you're doing more change than trying to please like both sides. 
should say for, for clarity, I am pretty against the big names. Um, I think anyone who, anyone who remotely follows my Twitter will see that I, I'm a bit ageist. Only when it comes to academia. Don't like the big names. Yeah. <laughs> So we've kind of already covered your third point pretty well, actually, which is to reclaim individual agency uh, as, as part of the, sort of the system, accountability from institutions and, and societies. One of the things that I think is quite, well, it's quite difficult with all three points we've had so far, is that a lot of how we're judged in academia is unfortunately all these things we don't want. So we're judged on, on publishing and where that paper goes. And, you know, one of the things you said in your piece was everyone was asking you where you've submitted it to. And every time you have a paper, people go, oh, where, where is it? Where's it going? As if that, I mean, it matters to some people. But how do we do these things without causing a lot of damage to our careers if we want to stay in science? Because if you don't want to stay in science, then great, you can do all these things and it, it, it's fine. You can you can leave and you'll still have a very successful, probably happier life and career than you would if you stayed in science. But if you stay in science, you do, to a certain extent, you do have to play the current game in order to get a fellowship because otherwise it's a lot harder to do that i mean it's a lot harder to do that if you don't come from a yeah. big name lab. so what i um, on one on one end if leaving science is better why are people uh, wanting you to stay in science in some broad um point of view the other one is yeah you, they tell you that you you have to most of the time have to publish in this journal to which might be really true or not really true in all cases um but then to what uh, to succeed in what in a career where i have to keep doing things that i don't want to do to be in that career that is where i do things that i don't want to do you know or uh, you know to get a grant you have to write uh, this thing that uh, in a way that you really don't like how to write and, and then what get get the grant to continue doing this thing you don't want to do. so that's where the whole thing crumbles because why are you why are you um telling me that to succeed in the career i need to do this is this is not the career i would like to do and of course we would like to do science you know another type of science or another type of academia but that means leaving the academia that is made like that so it doesn't mean leaving academia at all but it's leaving this academia for which i have to play this game and i'm going to look for rare places or create them yourself where well people you know are not judging me on the on where i published the paper and in reality there are even though not many and and um that's where you want to do your career in so uh, so you're telling me that i need to publish here but i don't want to be in your lab that wants students to publish like that so and there's no problem we're not made for each other in some way but at the same time you kind of have to have this um i mean be ready to not get this um success even though <laughs> you're not sure what the alternative success would look like people tell you that you're not going to succeed unless you do this thing that you don't want to do it means that you don't want this form of success there i mean you it wouldn't be success and it's not success if you get the position in a, a bad system yeah i mean so I, I i had this discussion recently with someone over lunch um and he wants to leave academia very much for this reason because he doesn't like how it works and this is the thing that's pushing me out more than anything else is that the system just doesn't work and it's not it's not a fair system it's not there's nothing good about the system i think at the moment and i do think it is i don't think it's impossible to change from the inside but i think it is very very difficult and i think you need the people who are tenured effectively to be the ones who drive that change because they are in a position where they could carry on in academia and never publish in a journal again and they're not going to lose their job so they can do that and if you did if enough of them those people did that then the journals would have to change their approach the funders would have to change their approach um so it is po i think it is possible in academia I just don't think it's ever going to happen yeah it's, it's, it's that change people that can change from within you can do it at time scales that are much longer if you really do it that are much longer mm -hmm. than the lifespan of a phd or, or or a postdoc so if because in concrete terms if you are changing the situation takes longer than four years i already left academia because you haven't changed anything by by being so that's why also this prefigurative uh, practice like 
it's a lifeline for people that are in the system now and they need to survive so you can survive by enacting it now what this future will be for everyone else later and then you are surviving this four years and at the same time you actually change the system now so from this point of view i mean how many generation are you sacrificing uh, until your your change from within actually take place but there is something so that's why i was happy to discover this concept of um yeah these ideas of prefigurative or, or which are, I mean, they are political movements. I, I think this, this leads nicely into point number four of your key points, which is, starts with actively. So, actively and intentionally oppose capitalism, colonialism, and patriarchy in every aspect of the scientific process, which is, I mean, some of these points are big yeah. points anyway, but that's a really <laughs> big point. So, I, I mean, those, those things, I think, have ran through academia forever if, as long as thought has existed those things seem to have gone straight through that whole process because it doesn't matter how far back you go you know it's always men in charge of doing it it's always men at the top in the top roles leading it and doing all the decision making i mean colonialism has a very unhappy relationship with science and then capitalism of course runs through science really because everything is about money in science whether that's the publication aspect or the ridiculous markup that we have to pay for various lab reagents Water, you wouldn't think water could cost quite so much or bits of plastic could quite cost as much as they do. And, you know, so, so these things obviously are so are you almost central to what academia is. I guess this leads very much into the fact that we need to break it down and think of it and build it up again from the start. Yeah. Right? So, I mean, I mean, I mean, the, the whole system is based on that. But it is more recognizing them in the practices and in the in the small things that that are the rules or the like i mean paying apcs or having open access based on money or uh yeah just looking at research just thinking that um scientists that work on cancer biology are in united states and europe so these forms uh of this big topic <laughs> um, and just and just refusing them and you cannot make them disappear but you can refuse participating in them and then there is so many people that are not opposed to it and are fine with um, with with perpetuating them so it's just as easy to not be fine with it and that's it i mean it just asking to to, to not be fine with it <laughs> uh, and then possibly do mm. something about it which might mean leaving academia but it doesn't doesn't have to be and can be creating a small bubble of uh, of academia that is not uh, directly governed like that i mean even just something as simple as, as sort of self-education right it must be that's a step in the right direction. As long as you're, you know, if you're actively thinking about all these things, then you're you're doing something. Even if you're not act, you know, even if you're not actually doing anything external, you, your your yeah, mindset and will. Just currently, societies that are for the community should um, help in this. Should um, like I, I don't know, have a list of of a critical literature on these topics instead of trying to hide it or saying that that's how they have to work but you can be self-reflective as a, as a person or as a society and that would um show more help and and uh, i don't know uh, trust from the people that belong to your community because otherwise it's just based on suspicion and people don't align with you anymore because they don't know where you stand on some issues self self-education and not just self-education like um looking for uh, the education that you want uh and that you need and that might not be what you get from the rest of your community automatically that, that's the thing you might have to completely recurate your twitter feed or whatever it is your newsletters and your uh subscription towards other directions but there are entire communities and labs and uh, social science uh, groups 
that have this information and study this information and that give you this information. And then you can share them with people in your community yourself. So on that note, what is the, this might be a difficult question, what is the one thing you would want people to come away from this conversation and do or think about? Really that you refuse. You have to refuse. You have to refuse all these things that, I mean, it sounds like a teenager rebellion thing, but um, <laughs> like what you can say, no, this is not how things are going because I'm not going like that. And you are part of this, how things are going and really think about what you want to do, what you want to contribute to and find the, in this, find the power to do it because you, you can, you can really be powerless, but by doing it, even though you cannot do it, you get the power to do it in some circumstances. But yeah, you, there's a lot of power in, in refusing and in, uh, in, in, in enacting your vision now and uh, surviving it. And at the same time, possibly changing it in your small area of influence. There you go. Be a rebellious teenager. I think, I think that might be my <laughs> smoothest ending to an episode yet. Where do I find out about the different bioarchive licenses? This CC, BY, CDXY nonsense is driving me nuts. Hey, that Bio have a resource for that? Ugh, that's your answer to everything. That's because they have everything you need to know about preprints. Sure, they probably have the basics, like info on the preprint servers, but what else is there? There's so much more. Looking to post a preprint, but not sure what different journal policies are? They have a collection to help you out with that. There are meetings around preprints and associated services. If you want to know how preprint adoption has changed over time, there's even a page on that. And COVID? They have a big section on preprints and the pandemic, plus some really cool infographics for communicating preprints. And university policies? Surely they don't have that. They collect uni policies where possible. Okay, okay, they do sound pretty impressive, but is it not a bit of an echo chamber? It can be, but ASAP Bio also engage with people who don't love preprints and have concerns. So we had an excellent discussion on this very topic a couple of months ago. Oh, is there anything ASAP Bio don't do? Honestly, no, they're so nice over there. They were so quick to jump in and support this show. It's your one-stop shop for info on preprints and open science initiatives. So head over to asapbio.org to learn more and subscribe to their newsletter for the latest in preprint news. If you want a deeper dive into the world of preprints, then look out for the next recruitment of ASAP Bio Fellows. Okay, and that is the show. If you enjoyed listening, then hit that subscribe button for more and leave us a review on whatever platform it is you're listening on. You can reach out to us on Twitter at MotionPod or online at preprintsandmotion.com. Didn't enjoy that? Well, we're all scientists here, so send us your review and let us know what works or what you'd like to hear more of, or less of. But until next time, have a good week.